Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility, episode 53 on the 5th of November. We're talking with Stephen Backer and Claire Reed about joining the planting revolution. Thanks for listening. Welcome to Let's Talk Possibility, where we explore ideas, challenge thinking, and inspire action. I'm Talana Simpson, and co-hosting with me is Eric Vermeulen. The local food movement has been gaining momentum over the last few years, advocating for buying locally grown food, even growing your own food. Should our gardens become food gardens? Claire Reed started planting her own vegetable garden when she was still at school, and with the challenges this posed, she actually invented the award-winning seed tape and started her own business, Real Gardening. Stephen Backer is a sustainable design maven who has moved his attention into designing and supplying the raw materials and services for small-scale natural subsistence farming in an initiative he calls Pocket Farmers. Stephen, maybe you want to just tell us a bit more about a pocket farm, what you mean by that, that concept. Well, it's a, it's a simple concept, really. I, instead of a large-scale farm, it's any pocket of land, let's, let's call it that, any small space that you can find, wh whether you live in a, in a house with, with a huge garden and you've got a corner that you want to dedicate to it, I call those little pockets. I, I, was, I was kind of inspired by a guy in the States, actually, who does something called pocket neighborhoods, where he has these little clusters of houses. Um, and that's actually the name of, of his development company. It's called Pocket Neighbourhoods, and that's, that inspired me to do this on the farming aspect of things. And, and some of the concepts you come up with, I know you, you're actually growing them at home in your, your own patch there is, is a little bed that's like a, just a raised, a raised yeah, one metre by one metre. One, one square metre raised bed. Um, and I suppose you could consider those uh, wooden pockets, if you will. <laughs> and that would be ideal for something like a, a patio, someone who yeah. doesn't have a garden but yeah. has a, a bit of sunlight yeah. somewhere. And the other concept that I find very exciting is the, the ones that go on the wall. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's the next thing that I'm looking into pockets. right now. I've, I've started with, uh, with raised beds, um, square metre ones, but I'm, I'm looking at doing boxes which can go on patios as well, smaller, so you can just fit it up against the wall. and then. Also, um, vertical um, trellises, if you will, where, where you can grow um, your vegetables and and things up the wall. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> up the wall. Um, so yeah, that's that's the next stage of, of my project of pocket farming. Mm -hmm. Claire, I mean, you, you've been <coughs> growing your own vegetables and food since uh, like for you were eleven years now. 11, yeah. yeah, for eleven years. I almost gave you age away, <laughs> but. You, you've got an incredibly innovative and successful product right now, um, your, your real gardens. And how, how did that come about from just planting your own vegetables to actually finding a business idea in this? Um, the area that I had available at home to plant in was the size of a front door. So it was one meter by two meters. Mm. That was in full sunlight. We did have other areas in the garden, but you need full sunlight more than five hours a day um, for vegetables to grow. So. I basically worked out that I could plant three tomatoes, six beans, <laughs> eight spinach to maximize yeah. the area. The whole thing I was doing this was so that I could sell the vegetables to my parents and that's how I would make my pocket money. So hey, so you, you were going to grow vegetables and sell them to your parents? <laughs> yeah. That's a brilliant idea. <laughs> it is. So um, this is going to be my, my way to get money for the end of year holiday. Um, so we went along to the local nursery to go and buy what we needed and my dad said that whatever we spent at the nursery would be his loan to me mm -hmm. so I would have to pay that back with vegetables before he'd stop paying for the vegetables so I thought well so that's why I worked out I needed to plant three tomatoes eight spinach so I would maximize my area with minimal cost input and, when and, I, and no one wanted to sell you three tomato seeds or no you have to buy a packet of 400 <laughs> who's going to plant 400 <laughs> seeds and then you have to go buy two kilograms of fertilizer and the lady's telling me I um, only need to use a teaspoon of it. So at the end of the day, I mean, this was now 11 years ago, I spent well over 200 rand on buying just the essentials to plant two square meters. That doesn't mm -hmm. physically make sense. It, mm. uh, there was no way I was going to be able to grow enough vegetables in that space to, to pay, pay back, back the 200 rand mm. and then try and make money. 
um, my parents thought it was quite funny. It, like, it kept me really busy outside. <laughs> but, but, but the December you spent at home wasn't that funny. <laughs> no, not at all. So um, I decided I was going to do it properly. I ended up sitting in the middle of the vegetable patch. I had a tape measure between my knees, so I knew how far apart these things were going. I'd drawn centimetre signs on my fingers, so I knew how deep <laughs> these holes were going. It was quite hilarious. And um, I took these tomato seeds, very frustrated that I had to buy 400, and I put some on my palms. And now you try and pick up one and put it in a hole. I mean, Stephen will know yes. it's near <laughs> impossible. Breathed a little bit too hard, trying to pick it up, like close to my eyes. Everything just went flying. And the hardy dogs had a lovely time eating all the seeds that were in the soil. And I just thought, you know, how do you, why would anyone want to start gardening in an urban space if it's this difficult and this expensive? Um, but the turning point was when I decided I didn't have enough hands, so I asked mm -hmm. our domestic worker, Maggie, to come and help me. And I said to Maggie, she could, because her hands were obviously clean and dry, she hadn't been in the garden with me, so I asked her to just hold the seed packet, pass me the seeds one by one, and tell me exactly what the seed packet was telling me to do. So in my head, she was going to pass it to me and say, 20 centimetres apart, 2 centimetres deep, and then I would do it. But it was only when Maggie said she has no idea what the seed mm -hmm. packets are telling her to do that I realised, wait a minute, I mean, the people that actually need to plant vegetables to survive can't yeah. understand how to do it. I have a very good education and I'm getting frustrated and I've spent way too much money for the amount of, of veggies I was going to get out. So I needed to create a way yeah. to solve that. And so instead of writing vegetable gardening for dummies, you went and produced a product <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> to help dummies like myself plant veggies. Mm. Uh, cool. So I've, yeah, so that's how it works. So it's, um, if people can see here, um, like this is carrots. So the carrots are in here. They're the right distance apart. Something like beans would be further apart within the strip. All the organic fertilizer, everything the plant needs is already inside here. So just for people who could, on just listening to the yeah. audio, what Claire is holding okay, up cool. is a strip of paper that's um, inside. You can actually see little dark bits where there's a bit of something put inside. Seeds and fertilizer <laughs> and stuff. <Yeah. laughs> and it's, it's, it's color coded as well. It's very, it shows you that it's carrots. It shows you um, where, to, where to cut it if you want to cut it into strips. It shows you... It yeah, shows you when to plant it, um, like very easy, like at what time of year, uh, like a simple one, two, three method. So you just mm -hmm. pop it in the ground so that the white area <coughs> is under the soil and the colored area is above the soil. So then that puts so there's, you there's at the no right measuring depth. How no. Mm -hmm. And then you just have to add water. And you don't have to now water a whole square meter area in the hope that it's touching a seed. Mm -hmm. You can just put some water on the strip exactly where the plant yeah. is. The paper keeps it moist, and you've got an improved germination. Because, mm. I mean, I, I want to pause on, on that whole water usage thing at the moment. I mean, uh, S South Africa has been on for years. You know, we're a dry country. Um, we should be, you know, using water sparingly. And this system of yours, you've actually won awards. You, you've yeah. researched, and you've using your system saves 80%. Yeah, up to 80% of, 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 of watering um amount yeah when compared to traditional planting yeah. and we measured it um during the germination period uh because after a plant is germinated in traditional methods and you can see the plant above the soil you could just water the plant but um before it's germinated and before you can see the seed you, you don't know where it you is. don't know um so you're putting this you're putting water exactly where it needs to go um you're reducing it by up to 80 percent and whatever what little water you do put on the strip, the strip absorbs, there's vermiculite, there, there's nutrients inside the paper that absorb the water, keep it, um, keep it exactly near the seed. So sure. we really are doing it with hardly any water, especially in the Eastern Cape, which mm -hmm. is a very, very dry place. So, I mean, Stephen, your garden pockets uh, and, and a product like Claire's um, real, uh, what, what do you call them, seed reels? Yes. Uh, Ma uh, marriage made in heaven? Definitely, I've already used some. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> yeah, when, when I initially planted the, the boxes that I set up at home, um, I, I can't even remember who it was, but somebody gave me some of Claire's seeds, and they were the first things that I planted, and yeah, I'll, I'll vouch for them, because <laughs> they work really well. Mm. Um, I, I, I don't know about... Uh, the whole watering aspect of things. Um, what did you recommend Claire, mm -hmm. for uh, for watering it? Would you use a sprinkler? Would you? Um, it all depends use on your a budget. Can? It all depends on your budget. Drip irrigation is they are yeah. fabulous. Yeah. Uh, very simple to use. Um, 
uh, systems that are becoming less expensive. Mm. At the moment, drip irrigation is probably running at about 11 rand a metre. Okay. Uh, but then you have to have it connected to like a rainwater mm. reservoir or something like yeah. that. So um, I love <coughs> drip irrigation, but um, sometimes it's it's um, something that people are a bit scared to start with. Don't really, you know, there's a lot of things that you have to put mm. in place before you can start. Mm. Um, in a portion of my garden, I've got an automatic sprinkler system. That's purely um, because I run a lot of tests. So mm. with the tests, I need to, um, when, I'm, when I'm testing it with traditional planting and real gardening and lots of different seeds, I need to know that it was, wa it was watered at when? 6 a.m. every mm. day, the same amount of water. So that's just for, for mm. my measuring purposes. The other side of my house, um, I water just with a watering can. So it all... I mean, as long as you can get the water to the plants, if you're yeah. someone that you're going to forget or you've got a really busy lifestyle or um, you come home late in the evenings, you're leaving really early in the mornings, yeah. invest in an automatic system. It's, a, it's an upfront investment, mm -hmm. but at least it's done. Yeah. If you're something, someone um, like my husband, Sean, he, he finds like he gets up in the morning with his cup of coffee and watering with this with the hose pipe or the watering can is kind of like a bit of meditation for him in the morning it gets his head straight yeah. he's out in the garden early in the morning he enjoys that mm. um he would be frustrated if there was an automatic sprinkler system everywhere yes. in the house yeah, it, it all just like cheating, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it, i think i think it's it's something um it, it's your it's your preference it's your lifestyle mm. it just you you need to know that a garden needs to be watered every day mm. so if you're able to do that by hand great that cost cuts the cost yeah. but if you can't invest in an automatic system mm -hmm. or drip irrigation yeah because I'm, I'm, I'm guessing watering it by hand and doing it carefully also goes a long way towards say saving on, on, on the amount of water yes. that you use yes mm. so um, if you're watering I mean with the sprinkler systems you can get specific heads that will you know um, just put the water down very localized, very yeah. localized and yeah. you can run it for a short period of time uh, yeah. so you can make um, automatic sprinklers very effective. You can make drip irrigation. Watering by hand is great. You can put it exactly where it needs to be. Um, you can see if that, if that patch is still quite moist, you can skip it and yeah. go to another one. So um, I think as long as it does get water, but it's not overwatered, a garden will need to be watered for five, ten minutes a day. Your sprinklers do not need to be on for an hour, two hours. Some of my mom's friends... They've got their sprinkler system set for an hour in the morning and an hour in the evening. Yeah. It doesn't need that much yeah. water. <laughs> Which is good to know because in this world where water is becoming a scarce exactly. modality. But I've got a question to ask you now. It's why do you actually advocate growing your own food? So, so Steve, why should we well, go I mean, into this effort of knowing when to water and how much? <laughs> one, of, one of the main reasons is just that you're getting healthy organic food. I mean, if, if you go to the shop, if you go to the supermarket and buy food, you don't know where it's come from. Um, whereas if you're growing in your own, own garden, you've planted that seed, you've, mm. nurtured, you've nurtured that plant, and you don't even have to refrigerate the stuff. You know, y y you walk out whenever you need vegetables for a salad or whatever the case may be, and it's right there, ready for you. Ready to be it's healthy. So, I mean, how long does it take to get to that point where you can go outside and... Gra grab some rocket for the salad or well, it depends entirely on what you're planting but I <sighs> so I mean what, what should you be planting Claire because I, I, I know that you, you, what, what one of your products is like a whole vegetable patch basically um, of you yeah. know it's, it's a variety of stuff you you, you buy the packet you, you go out and then you've got lettuce and carrots and yeah so um, this is a complete vegetable garden um, people can see it like that. Uh, basically, in here, there's tomato, onion, cabbage, spinach, carrot, lettuce, beetroot, beans, corn, and peas. So that's that's our entire range. It's a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes people don't know what they're going to use a lot of in their yeah. garden. They don't know what grows well in their garden, what doesn't. Um, so it's nice maybe to start with a little bit of everything mm. uh, in one season. And then you can see I use a lot more tomatoes than I did peas, for instance. Right, yeah. So next season maybe plant tomatoes you know where you planted your peas and maybe don't plant peas again so um i think it's it takes a while to start a veggie garden i mean from when you're planting to when you harvest it's three months mm -hmm. but then you have to understand that for it to be sustainable and for you to continue to get vegetables out of it you should really be putting something in the ground every week or so mm -hmm. every you know it could be every two weeks even but you don't want all of your lettuces at once 
then you're yeah. giving it over yeah. to neighbors, you're bringing it to yes. work, you're just you're, you're <laughs> sick and tired, sick you're sick and tired of salad, <laughs> and then all of a sudden you have to start buying it because you didn't you kind know, of do the succession yes. properly. So I think it's take the area you've got. I usually divide it into quarters. So if you plant one quarter this month, Mm-hmm. then plant the next quarter the next month and then so on so when you start harvesting from the first quarter after three months you can plant that quarter again and then depending on how many people are in your family or what you kind of use um ration that quarter yeah. out accordingly so you generally want to be planting you know every week for 16 weeks to start the cycle and then it's um just popping things you know in and amongst you you, you don't have nothing has to be in a straight line all the time or you, you don't have to have just tomatoes in one bed and just peas in another. You can mix it up. Um, there are things that don't grow very well together, mm-hmm. um, like sweet corn and tomatoes don't like each other. So <laughs> then you would separate okay. those. Or just put them on the opposite ends of exactly. the patch. Mm. Um, there's lots of information about that um, kind of thing on the internet. But I think uh, vegetable gardening is a lot of trial and error. It's a lot of seeing what works well in your garden. Um, some people would think that tomatoes maybe are too messy or it's too difficult to trellis them but if you plant them close to a fence somewhere in your garden then maybe you can just use that and they they act as like a nice Mm. um, Nice coverage type thing or a feature so I think there's no right or wrong it's just getting in but also a lot of patience because things go wrong birds will come and eat stuff you, you'll take a you'll take a carrot out the ground, and the worms have had a wonderful time eating it, and you never got round to it. Um, <laughs> so it's it's a lot of um, the, there's quite a bit of frustration, but the joy, so what's the, reason? Yes. the joy what's the of reason going out. I mean, there's a wonderful quote that says, um, "Nothing compares to the anticipation a garden provides," and it's it's that going out in the morning and saying, "Oh my <coughs> word, that wasn't there before." That yeah. rocket just came. I mean, that yes. was me this morning. I went out, <laughs> and yesterday there was no rocket in my garden, and now I've got all these little, you know, rocket plants coming up. Mm-hmm. And it's that excitement. It's this, there's constant change. There's something um, that's always happening. But the more you give into a vegetable garden, the more you're going to get out of it. And then you start exploring with, um, you've got all these, t- this is what happened to me the other day, um, all my onions came up at once. So now I've got recipes for onion marmalade, onion jam. <laughs> I mean, I've started, I've started to bottle, little do all my family and friends know they're getting lemon marmalade, onion marmalade, everything. Yeah, kind of marmalade. Stuff but, is over Christmas. but it's exciting. And yes. it's, it's that type of getting your hands dirty, getting back into nature. But you enjoy that tomato when you bite into it and you know that... It tastes different. It right? tastes different. It it's does. not full yeah. of water. It's not injected. It hasn't been, you know, sitting on a shelf or pumped with the gas to ripen it. Yeah. Um, it really is good from your garden, and you 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 get excited about it. You want to taste food again. You, yeah. y- we need to get back to that. We've just become this fast-paced society mm-hmm. where it's all about quantity over quality. And I think we have to just go back to what is food supposed to taste like because it's not taste it's not supposed to taste yeah. like what you think it so is. There's the also s- some people then that that will not have the interest in time, energy, space for whatever reason to to grow their own food, but are very happy to to go and actually purchase it. So, you know, little markets are, yeah. you know, buying from the the local farmers markets or their neighbour, <coughs> like, um, or their children. Like you were going to insult your, your <laughs> parents. Um, but then it brings up this whole debate about, you know, is, is local, I know you're saying is Steve, local is lacquer, <laughs> which means that, that local is better. Um, I wondered what, what your thoughts are because there's, there's this debate like I've been reading out there about local versus um, organic. Mm-hmm. Because sometimes, you know, part of the reason I would think for growing your own food is, is you want to save the environment. Besides the, the issues around um, organic food is tastier and healthier Healthy, yeah. and then obviously less pesticides and less as you were saying like whatever mm. gas to mm. uh, ripen them and, yeah. and 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 that um if if it's about organic organic food is often when you go to buy it more expensive or an hour it's, it's perceived definitely more mm. expensive I mean, it is yeah, it, it is, it is and, definitely. It, and part of that is because of the transportation sometimes to there's not many organic farms and they will be somewhere and then there's because of the seasons and, and you're saying what, what works in your garden, hmm. obviously on, on farms as well, it must be the same thing, what works in that farm, that, you know, that climate, that time of year. So the transport of getting 
organic food to to a place adds to carbon emissions and you know they, they call it the food miles yeah. it, versus growing your own local yeah. which but local because okay. of the the conditions sometimes they they yeah. apparently need pesticides or whatever you know to try and help but local then it doesn't need the transportation doesn't need the refrigeration to to preserve it so mm -hmm. you're getting it picked and, and to the market and into your mm -hmm. onto your plate within like a day or two so I don't know if you have any, any comments around that, you know, the whole debate around pesticides versus petroleum. Stephen? I, I, I think there's a really simple answer, just grow your own. I, I, I know you say that, that a lot of people, and I, I recognize this, they don't have the time or the inclination to do it. Mm. But there are more and more people out there who are willing to come and help you set up your garden and maintain it. So that is still the way to go. If 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 uh, transport costs, you know the um, the cradle to cradle thing, which we've discussed in in, in a past uh, chat that we had. Past podcast, I think. Yeah, um, the um, shows. It's like, what does it cost from from growing it to getting it ready for sale to selling it, and then back to your house? If that concerns somebody. I think the, the best thing to do is, is to grow it on your own property. Right. Or, or buy local. Mm. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. lots of people, job. I mean, um, I've now convinced my mother in her Parkview house to take out lots of her flowers, and she loves her vegetable garden, but it took a long time for her to get that mindset around, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's not that, well, I think vegetable gardens are very pretty, but if you're comparing them to you know, beautiful manicured lawns and hedges, they're probably not. Yeah. Um, so I think that there will always be people that don't really have the space or don't have the time or don't really want to grow their own. Mm. Um, however, they want to eat well and they want to eat locally. Mm. Um, so I think it's, it's all about uh, buying something that's in season. Mm. That's a big thing. Um, there's no point buying red onions that have been brought over by Spain, from Spain. You know, the ones from the Free State are just as just as good um, so I think it's it's um, sometimes you know, don't don't go just according to price when you're mm. when you're buying your your vegetables and um, the packet that has 20 tomatoes in it and looks like a far better value um, you buy the one with six that is probably going to taste 10 times better you're probably gonna have to use half the tomatoes you were going to from the packet of 20 and they'll probably last longer yeah. so I, yeah. I, I find in, in our house we, we, we tend to throw away a lot of fresh produce because it just doesn't keep. I mean, mm. it's there, there are two of us at home, and mm. so exactly that you know, you buy the pocket with six onions, but by the time you get to the last one or the last it's two, already it's already sprouting. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's not that we don't eat at home a lot, you know, it's just <laughs> but I think another thing is that, 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 that that's very um, pertinent around growing your own food is not just doing it for yourself. Mm. Uh, but also around the kind of a community sustainability and, and upliftment. Yes. So what I've done, um, which I absolutely love, and I'm starting, lots of other people in Blegari are loving it as well. Mm -hmm. And so I took the verge area um, on either side of my driveway. So usually people have, but when I bought the house, it was just grass. Lots mm -hmm. of people do IV or that kind mm. of stuff there. Um, you're watering it anyway. You're getting your gardener or yourself to cut the grass or cut back the yeah. ivy. So I just planted spinach. So I did two on, raised on, on beds. On your pavement. Yeah. So, so I did occupied the sidewalk. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did two raised beds just with wood. But, yeah. I mean, you could do it. You could dig it straight in. You wouldn't even have to do a raised bed. So I just planted spinach. Last year I did tomatoes and other mm. stuff as well. But the spinach was a huge hit. So I've just done spinach this year. And um, about eight people a day probably ring on our doorbell and ask if they can buy our spinach. When I tell them they can just pick a few leaves and mm -hmm. leave some for the rest of the neighbors. It's created this whole community, whereas um, awesome. there's, I also have herbs and stuff growing. There's an Indian family which are down the road and they cook a lot with coriander because mm -hmm. it's part of their culture. And um, they absolutely love that my coriander you, doesn't taste like um, shop coriander. Yeah, because <laughs> they're saying that when they cook with the coriander from the shops, all they can taste is chlorine, the taste of okay, chlorine yeah. in their food. So um, they pick a lot of my coriander. Um, and they drop off curries and samosas and stuff that they've cooked so with got it. So they've got a whole trade. And you've got a whole community. The, the ADT guards who, yeah. who pick um, some spinach before they go home in the evening or after their shift to their family. I've gotten little notes on my mm -hmm. gate thanking them, thanking me, you know, from their yeah. wives that's, or whatever. That's so awesome. it's like that is 
such a, an added extra. It's created a, a conversation, communication. Um, we're looking out for one another. Yeah. Um, I think, it, and that's all just because of some spinach planted where ivy would have been. And, you know, and I think you've even taken the, the giving back to the community another step and that you've been going into schools and actually with your, you know, the real seeds of that, yeah. showing them how to grow food in some of the schools. And I believe um, the schools are even able, they create growing too much produce to feed Ex just yeah. the children. They're starting to sell it to the community, which becomes an income source. So that is, I mean, one of, the, one of the schools in Limpopo is making 1,800 rand a month. That's a lot of money for a school in Limpopo. Imagine the textbooks that could buy. <laughs> 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 so um, it's getting children excited as well about gardening and about the fact that the more you look after the soil and look after the environment and pick up the litter <coughs> and, you know, understand... And the effect that all of that has. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I mean, a, a mom came into our shop the other day to buy some Christmas presents and she had a five, her five-year-old daughter with her and I, some peas were growing up um, one of the windows in the office and I was saying to the little five-year-old, that's peas, you know, you know, this is what a pea plant looks like. And very clever. I mean, she turned to me and said, but um, the, isn't the packet a little bit too big? Will the plant not break? So I couldn't understand what she was saying. But in her head, peas come out of the frozen packet, like in the bottom of the drawer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the packet is, you know, like 20 centimeters by 20 centimeters. And in her head, how is this poor little pea plant going to, to grow, grow that big packet? Um, so she didn't oh, understand. Wow. So, so showing you the as you were saying, I think, Steve, that, that, that feeling of walking into your garden and picking the food. And I know your little son is, um, oh, it's had a big impact it. on yeah. him and the way his understanding with food. Mm. Have you got anything to add? Oh, I mean, when, when I built a couple of raised beds for myself, he requested that I build him a little one. And as soon as he could, he planted his own vegetables. And he's one of, I think, the few kids who doesn't give grief when it comes to eating his greens. <laughs> I mean, even, yeah. his, even his mum is surprised. You know? It's like, how, how come Josh eats his greens? What yeah. are you doing? It's like, he grows his own. So he's, he's got an awareness of it now. And that's what's important, yeah. I think, and, and at I schools think, as well. Yeah, because I think it's also that awareness around this whole notion of consumerism. Mm. And that, you know, where, when you've got a, a big packet of frozen peas uh, versus what one plant can produce, mm. And, and you understand that dynamic. Yeah. Um, I, I think it just awakens a whole different perception around mm -hmm. how, how to treat food, how, uh, how to treat the world around you. But also um, how long it has taken and how much effort has gone into growing that butternut or onion. I mean, onions take one like carrot. 280 days or one carrot. Mm -hmm. I mean, you are going to, if there's a little black spot, fine, cut around it. Yeah. But, you're, but not, you, you're not throwing the whole thing away. <laughs> That's taken... A lot of energy, I mean, food, res I mean, water resources, yeah. all of that's gone into that, you know, one piece of fresh produce. And I think we have to and also understand that. Be become more, what's, what's the word? Because um, I know it's like some of your carrots you showed me are the most wonderful shapes <laughs> and, and, and shapes. sizes. Yes, and and we're not like this precondition <laughs> that a carrot looks one way yeah. and one yeah. way only. Yeah. It's like... Well, all shapes and sizes yeah. still carrots, and it's still nutritional, and it's and it's yeah. yummy. Um, I, I noticed on, on our pop-out chat, uh, someone's really, um, who is it? Uh, Jay has said that uh, Claire, she bought some of your um, tomatoes and planted them before the winter, and and then she also says uh, uh, she's learning a whole. Uh, she's still learning the whole thing around companion planting. Mm -hmm. uh, what on earth is that? So some <laughs> things go better together. So um, whether it's uh, some plants will take nitrogen out of the soil, some plants like beans will put nitrogen into the soil. Mm -hmm. So you want those plants to work together. If you've got two plants that are both wanting to take nitrogen out of the soil, you don't want them fighting for a finite resource in the soil. Okay. You want it to work in a cycle. So okay. what you put in, I take out. So companion planting works along with that principle, but also um, it takes pests into consideration. So um, cabbage worm, for instance, um, doesn't like parsley or coriander. So if you plant that kind of um, herb alongside your cabbage, mm -hmm. um, they both thrive and the cabbage worm is deterred. You're not killing it. You're not taking something out of the ecosystem because there will be a bird or something that is endemic to that area that will thrive on that cabbage right. worm, but it does need to be eating your cabbage. So it's, it's looking at... Um, it's 
rather adding um, extra extra plants into your soil yeah. or um, placing certain things together. What I told Jay was to um, plant the basil near tomatoes. Uh, yeah. they're, they're companions in the fact that they grow well together, but the basil actually adds to the flavor of the tomatoes. So you actually okay. get a, um, you get kind of like a basil infused tomato flavor. Um, and a lot of the, the, um, the pests will stay away from the, from the tomato. It's not just based on the basil. We right. plant a few other things with our tomatoes. So it's a lot of, um, there's a lot of literature on the internet with um, some plants like other plants, um, but it's basically to do with which ones take nutrients out of the soil, which mm -hmm. ones put the nutrients back in the soil, and to do with the pest system. And then there's also flowers like nasturtiums or marigolds. Then they would repel pests but bring pollinators into okay. your garden. So companion planting looks at um, working with the environment rather than spraying and creating a sterile environment right. in which you're not going to get a healthy yeah. plant and you end up ingesting all of that. Sure. And, and so your seed drills, any <coughs> possibility in the future maybe that they would be sort of companion pre-packed? So they already are, okay. actually. So the way we set out the beds, you'll see like tomatoes very far away from sweet corn. So um, in our community beds and um, that we do in the, in, the, in the rural areas in our garden in a box, um, the parsley is already in the in the bed with mm. the coriander um, and then we we uh, teach that when we do the training so we try and do it as as much as possible um, when when we do the bigger gardens the smaller mix packs the smaller I mean the um, the mix packs we can we can show mm -hmm. the companion yep. planting but the smaller gardens when you're buying one variety we rather than just write it inside the packaging mm. so we're trying to get but it's um, it's not you know a, a a cut in stone method. I mean, some people will say that one thing grows better with the other, whereas another pe people will say try something different. So yeah. I think so it's, it's also about trying, because as you said, experimenting what yeah. works in your environment. Your exactly, because there may be there may be different kind of pests in your environment mm -hmm. or different birds. Or so I think it's also playing around with what you have in your yeah. garden. And I mean, the Johannesburg, I think we're you know sort of high felt climate. Is, is that fairly conducive to be a, being able to run your veggie garden year round? Um, there's obviously winter is a yeah, is that's, that's a difficult. Asked. But um, like cabbage and spinach and peas and onions are fine during the winter. Um, so there, there's um, more of your dull leafy crops. Those would be winter ones. The bright crops are so your beetroot, your carrots, your your tomatoes, um, are summer crops because mm. that's. Although that being said. <laughs> <laughs> Your tomatoes that I planted uh -huh. grew right through winter. Yeah, so this is what Jay's even saying now. Mm. So, um, but that's a lot to do with them being incubated in the paper, especially during that cold time of winter. Um, even our our beans don't get affected so much at, by frost at the at the root of the, at the base of the plant because of the paper and because of that that warm environment. But if you're planting traditionally with seed, tomatoes probably wouldn't. Yeah, they won't take. Yeah, but yeah. the seed we use is very high quality. It's open pollinated. Um, <coughs> it's, it's as natural as we can find. Mm -hmm. um, so we do try and give a, a product that you can plant for a greater period of time. But there will be stuff that won't germinate in winter and yeah, will only germinate in summer. Like, uh, seasonal. Yeah. So if you'd like to find out more about our guests, please look at their profiles on our website, ltp.letstalknetwork.tv. And Stephen, one way people can get hold of you. What's the best way, quick? They can go onto my Facebook page for Pocket Farmers. It's facebook.com uh, forward slash Pocket Farmers. Farmers. And Claire? Probably email. I'm quite bad with Facebook, <laughs> but I, I may and get better choose. one of these days. <laughs> um, it's Claire, C-L-A-I-R-E, at Real Gardening, R-E-E-L, gardening.co.za. Great, and we'd love to hear your views and see photos of your, your gardens and process. So um, tell us on Facebook or tweet us at LT Possibility. But until then, from me, Talana Simpson, and all of us here on Let's Talk Possibility, have a great week and go share the possibilities.